the first piece of evidence is the large redshifts, which um, supports the idea that they are fast moving and far away from us, right? So we've already got that under control. That doesn't really tell us what they are. It just simply tells us that they are far away. Um, so what could explain the very high luminosity that we see from a quasar? Yeah, so for the high luminosity, the best explanation from the model that we have is that there is swirling gas that's falling into the supermassive black hole around the accretion disk, and that is generating heat and light. Um, as we saw in the activity, it's trillions of times more luminous than our sun, right? Which very clearly states that it can't be a star-like, uh, you know, energy process. So this mass uh, to light conversion around the black hole is the only thing that has the ability to explain this, the extreme luminosity. It just can't be anything else. All right, so we've got our very high luminosities. It, it turns out that it's very efficient to generate light in this type of system. Um, and now we need to also understand why does that luminosity change over short time scales? So what is the best explanation of that short-term um, luminosity changes? Okay, I see far and away the most votes for C, that it's the uneven temperature and mass distribution throughout the disk. And the temperature distribution comes from that underlying mass distribution, right? So changes in mass going into the accretion disk over time result in changes in temperature and those changes in temperature are what account for the changes in luminosity. So more mass means more energy being converted to light. And um, if there are, you know, there are, I mentioned earlier the idea that other stars could enter the accretion disk or maybe nearby gas can enter the accretion disk. Well, some of that gas might be brought toward the accretion disk, not by just, you know, wandering there, but because of gravity from a, a nearby galaxy passing um, and thus shifting the overall um, location of mass within the galaxy around this supermassive black hole. And so those gravitational influences can cause mass to be shuttled toward that supermassive black hole. I mention this because keep this idea in mind as you read for Wednesday's class, when we talk about galaxy collisions and how they can change the output from um, active galactic nuclei the quasar as an example of an active galactic nucleus. Okay, so we've got our large redshifts, our luminosities and our luminosity fluctuations all explained. So now why do quasars have this weird spectrum that doesn't look like stellar spectra? So which piece of our model explains that? Okay, this is the, probably the least obvious one right, of all the things in the model, because I have never told you about anything other than stellar spectra. So um, the answer to this one ends up being, so, okay, there are different temperature regions at different areas in the accretion disk, right? And each of these by itself would produce a stellar spectrum. And as you combine all of them, you get a much broader spectrum and uh, because of the redshift, we see it pushed all the way outside of the visible range. All right, so yeah, I guess this can somewhat, okay, I'll say this is part one of non-stellar spectrum. There's a part two that's also really important though. So there's also a, um, what we call a dusty donut around the accretion disk. So you can think of the accretion disk as the hottest place where matter is entering, but around that very hot place uh, that's actually glowing actively, there's, kind of matter on the margins that hasn't yet been incorporated into the rest of the accretion disk. And that is generally dusty. And because of that dusty shroud, um, which tends to glow in infrared, it adds more and more uh, luminosity to the low wavelength side of the spectrum, but not to the high wavelength side. So this is a little bit more of a technical detail, but it does result in this side of the spectrum um, being pushed upward, right? So you'd get even more flattening out here if you do have that dusty donut. And when we look at those different examples of quasar spectra, then we saw some of them were very tilted, right? But some of them were quite flat and it could be the presence of these dusty donuts around those that help explain some of the, um, the more flat spectrum that we see. Okay, there's a part two to this story though. Uh, we'll get to it. 
Okay. So that's the non-stellar spectra. Um, so when I'm thinking of non-stellar spectra, this um, flattening out of the stellar spectrum is part one, but there's actually other light that comes from the particle jets. So I'll talk, to, I'll talk about those at the very end here. All right, so the next piece of evidence we wanna explain is our broadened emission lines. So which piece of our model could explain broad emission lines? Okay, I see most votes for B here. And B is definitely part of it, right? So the idea that there's rotation in this system um, is the reason we see broad emission lines. That's what I just talked about with regards to the activity. But also um, remembering back to the tully fisher relation, how we measure the mass of um, a spiral galaxy, that also comes from observing broadened emission lines. So it's the rotation that leads to line broadening here. Okay, so we've got fast rotation of gases helping to explain our broad emission lines. Um, and so how do we explain the small extent of this object? Yeah, so of course, the reason we know that the size is small is because we've looked at those light fluctuations, right? And that has showed us that the size of, a, of the source of energy must be around the size of our solar system. So remember, this is the analogy of if one side of the, if the sun gets brighter, we see the front side of it first and the back side of it bright and last, right? And so it's because the energy output comes from such a small size and is at such a high luminosity that the only good explanation is that it's related to a black hole. Nothing else would have the capacity to generate that much luminosity in such a small size. Um, remember when we looked at black holes, it was the idea that black holes have a lot of mass within a small size that pointed to a black hole existing there, right? And so it's a, the idea is that a black hole is able to gather this huge accretion disk that could be producing such high luminosity. All right, we've got one more piece, observable particle jets. So how could we explain these particle jets? All right, yes. So this particle jet situation is related to the magnetic fields that are emerging from the poles of the accretion disk. So they're um, pointing perpendicular to the kind of flat plane of the accretion disk. So this is kind of a cartoon image of what that would look like. You have your black hole, your accretion disk is a flat disk around it, and the magnetic field kind of looks like the same general pattern of magnetic field that we might expect from any other object. Um, it has a strong value near the poles of the spinning object. Earth's magnetic field is also stronger near Earth's poles. Um, there's actually debate about exactly how the magnetic field of a quasar gets generated. So I'm not gonna dive into that rabbit hole, um, but you do have a very strong magnetic field at each pole. Um, so Earth's magnetic field is very strong near the pole. And because of that, when we see particles from the solar wind enter Earth's atmosphere, they do so by following magnetic field lines in to the Earth's pole. That's why we see the aurora, my virtual background, only in the polar regions generally, because that's where the particles are funneled and then they hit uh, molecules of gas in our atmosphere and cause them to glow these lovely colors due to emission. So the kind of the reverse thing happens in a quasar where you have electrically charged particles instead of coming toward, um, you know, from the sun toward the earth, they're coming from the accretion disk being spit out from the black hole, um, funneled up toward the magnetic field lines. Once they reach a magnetic field line, because they're charged, that happens to guide them along a magnetic field line in a spiral pattern. So they'll spiral around this magnetic field line, um, shooting away from the black hole. Because the magnetic field is so strong, they move really fast and they generate a type of um, radiation that is not thermal radiation. It's called cyclotron radiation. We can produce a similar sort of radiation in uh, particle experiments here on Earth. Um, and this also has the type of um, you know, characteristic line shape that we see from a quasar spectrum. So this is 
why I was um, stumbled earlier um, talking about non-stellar spectrum. This is another important source of non-stellar spectrum for our quasar. All right, so this is also related to the particle jets, of course. That's why we call them particle jets because they're particles, I don't know, jetting away from the black hole along its strong mag magnetic field lines. And they point in opposite directions, perpendicular to the accretion disk, partially because some of that material, if it's being you know, pushed inward by the rest of the accretion disk, has nowhere else to go but up, but are also partially because it's following those uh, field lines. Okay, so just focusing on only the spectrum, right? Stars produce the thermal spectrum. And so if you add together a lot of thermal spectrum for, of different temperatures, you approach a flat line shape. This flat line shape is also um, has a contribution from this cyclotron radiation that matches this, you know, characteristic kind of high energy, um, sorry, high intensity at short wavelengths, low at long wavelengths. And there's also emission peaks, and that's due to some of the atoms that are glowing just because they're uh, energized in the accretion disk. So this is what leads to the whole complicated spectrum. Okay, um, there's kind of a corollary here. Um, when we look at spectra of stars, we see absorption from gases in their atmospheres. Um, and with our so-called radio stars, right? We see emission instead. So these are kind of the um, complementary line shapes to each other. And so when we look at the actual spectra from data, then you can actually see this sort of mirror image effect. So even if you look at a, a line shape of a star that, you know, both of these have a line shape like this, right? Both of them have this characteristic down sloping line shape. But because the quasars have emission peaks and the stars have absorption peaks, then that's how we can um, it's another way to tell a stellar spectrum apart from a quasar spectrum. Okay, that's a little bit of an advanced point, but I wanted to make it in case you were curious. And do I have, there's a, there's a link on the slides here that takes you to the source of this data. It's from a Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, exercise, and you can make a research project out of this too, if you are so inclined, they have ideas. Okay, so at this point, we've explained everything that we observe about quasars, hopefully to a level of satisfaction. Here we go. That's the whole model. What other questions do you have about this model to explain quasars? Is it still a quasar once all the material is consumed by the black hole? Nope. Then it's just a regular galaxy again. Yeah, so that's a, actually a really important point. Thank you. Is that um, a quasar is an active galactic nucleus. And the part that's active about it is that it's actively uh, consuming material. And so eventually, if it succeeds in consuming all of that material and no new material is brought in, then it will stop um, producing jets. It will stop producing the high luminosity if there's no more accretion disk. And so it's no longer a quasar. So yes, that's a very important point that we'll come back to on Wednesday. <laughs>